Well hello good people, part three of the Pete and Paul engine build. Before I paint it I decided I would hone the cylinders after all rather than wait until I started putting it together. There's no point trying to clean this block twice and it's damn heavy. This block on its own weighs more than a complete Aronka or Praga engine ready to run so manhandling it is fairly impossible. Fortunately I've got the hydraulic hoist to lift it up and down off the bench which has been a godsend. I think I'd have given up otherwise. Block and tackle would probably pull the roof down. So I'm going to hone these cylinders now. I've been on and on about honing. I've become a bit of a cylinder bore, I know. I've done that one already in the true style of doing a bit and then turning the camera on. So a bit of squirt down the hole. This one's slightly rusty actually and a good shine up. I think I'll leave the strop attached, hopefully avert any kind of disaster, not put the full weight of the engine on the plastic. I did check it for cracks before, just lift it up a little bit so not bearing all the weight. Right, paraffin time. My shoes aren't full of paraffin at least. I just need to find an old paintbrush now. But I've got some new ones, I'll use one of those. DC3 seat cushion kneeler. Took that off the scrap line at Coventry in 2001, I suppose. Helped myself to a few mementos of all the old sprayers that were destined for museums. I don't think any of them got chopped up, fortunately. I've put the crankcase this way round because there's a big hole at the that end where the oil goes through to the timing gears from the valve chamber so there's plenty of room for all this filthy muck to run out. The main exercise here is to remove all that gritty muck that was in the bottom of the valve chamber that was the sort of worst bit I can, I'm not too bothered about the rest of it I'm not too worried about the inside of the crankcase and everything because it's actually quite clean kind of a fairly perfunctory clean but this valve chamber was pretty horrible and there's potential for all that muck to be washed down into the main bearings which is exactly what we want to avoid. There's a sort of feel in there, see? Amazing, that's most of it that you washed out already. It's pretty much gone. What I have to do in a bit is hoik the engine out, pour the paraffin into a container through a cloth to get all the bits out and then use it again once all that stuff's loosened and gone. A blast with the uh, compressed air squirt will probably finish cleaning this valve chamber up very nicely. Bath time over, a gallon of paraffin, lots of scrubbing with a paintbrush and I'm very pleased with that. I smell rather of paraffin, I think I'll have to remove most of my clothing before I go indoors otherwise there will indeed be a stink. I'm very pleased with cleaning this out, I don't know whether that shows very well, let me get a torch. There was a sort of layer of gritty sediment in the bottom. If you see anything in there now, it's because I've just been messing around since. But that's all washed out. I flushed it out several times and then I blasted it with the air squirt as well. So it's pretty clean in there now. Nothing nasty to wash down into the main bearings. I'll give it another blowout and uh, maybe a hoover up as well before it's all assembled. I'm going to paint the block shortly because I'm back to work soon. And that means it can have a couple of weeks to dry off and harden up. And then we'll have a look at the oil system. 
and I want to start building the block up. I want to get the crank and pistons back in and the valve gear. So we're back to a short block and then we can start making the peden pole bits. I don't want the thing in pieces any longer than it needs to be. It's an easy way of losing bits and uh, I don't want to forget how it came apart anyway. If you're wondering about the short clip of honing the block, well, I was in Tbilisi last week, Tbilisi, Georgia. The Georgians have an 8,000 year culture of making wine and I was there for four nights. So that was 2,000 years worth of culture every evening. And unfortunately, after indulging in a spot of culture, I then did a bit of film editing and I appear to have removed quite a lot of film, but I think it was only boring stuff like me hoovering the block, cleaning out the water jacket and stuff, which quite frankly, any sober man would have deleted anyway. So hurrah to Georgian wine, much better than the French rubbish. I managed to dollop a coat of paint on the block before I left. All interesting ships are painted in this colour, so good enough for me. And it matches my hair. What we're going to do is have a look at the Ford oil system now. Ford oil system is very simple and rather clever. This is the Ford oil pump. It fits in the sump. And the first thing to understand about this, it's really a lift pump, not a pressure pump. It's driven by this little gizmo that sits in the block here and drives down to the oil pump and up to the distributor and that skew gear engages with the camshaft. The oil comes up and then is diverted along a pipe here. So I'll move the camera a little bit, show you the end of the pipe. There are, there's the end of the pipe and its outlet's about five sixteenths of an inch diameter. So the oil comes out of the pipe and fills up this part of the oil chamber because this as well as being where all the valve springs and bits sit is actually a chamber to feed down into the engine again and each main bearing is fed just by a hole now it's very difficult to see the hole i don't know whether i can light it up or not at all try and move the camera you can see the hole or a little bit of the hole i saw the crescent you saw the hole of the moon probably someone should write that in a song it's just there behind the first lifter boss and the oil runs down there just under gravity to the front main bearing and there's another hole just to the right of the boss here smaller hole that feeds the forward camshaft bearing now once this lift pump has filled this bit up then the oil cascades over this dam that's here and fills up this center part so the center part goes from this dam here to this dam here, which is lower. Again, if I take the gizmo out, you should be able to see there's a feed hole there for the center main bearing. Now this dam is lower than the first one. And right in the back corner there, I'll try and move this. Yes, you can see it there, just behind the lifter boss again is the gravity feed for the rear main bearing, which of course is the biggest of all the bearings and has the thrust bearing on it as well. So this whole area fills up with oil to a certain amount. Now each of the lifters has got a little hole in it, which allows a certain amount of oil to run down, not very much. It allows it to run down onto the face of the lifter and each camshaft lobe. In theory, this whole chamber could fill up with oil. And of course, it needs to have some kind of overflow so on the original Ford cover, you can see there's a boss here for a pipe. And there's a big pipe that goes from here, sort of a quarter of the way up the cover, which regulates the depth of the oil, down to here. And that goes straight into the sump. And of course, there's a dipper pan above the sump proper. And that oil runs into the dipper pan and fills each of the, the dipper bowls up if you like and is, that's picked up by the con rods which of course dip that center part into the dipper pan every time they get to bottom dead center. I begin to feel like I need another glass of that Georgian wine. We're only about halfway there yet. When the car goes uphill obviously the oil wants to run that way down the valve chamber and of course because of these dams each chamber only allows a certain amount of oil over at any one time. 
and it protects the bearing feed to the main bearings. So the bearing feed being behind the dam there and fairly high up here, but this dam is very high. So of course, even at quite high angles of attack, in the car that is, this being the front of the engine, the oil system continues to feed the main bearings. And any excess, of course, down here is still gonna run down that pipe and into the dipper pans. The dipper pans themselves have got a bias towards the front of the car being high in the air. So they slope down that way with a much steeper side here. And obviously the oil can cascade from dipper pan to dipper pan, but it's always gonna have enough oil in there for the rod to dip the oil as it rotates. When the car goes downhill, things aren't quite so good. This forward bearing obviously gets a lot of oil, but these two are at risk of being starved because there's very little keeping the oil from going down the holes now, not running forward. There's also a hole through here, which allows oil to run through onto the timing gears. Also, the bias on the dipper pan is not good. You've only got to be about that sort of angle and there's no oil going to be sitting in the dipper pan. The rods aren't going to be dipping any oil at all. In the car, when you go down a hill, it's unlikely you're going to be using much throttle. And so I think oil starvation was assumed to be okay for a short period of time. And of course, one could do the naughty thing and knock it out of gear, turn the engine off and, and glide if one was going an awful long way. And that would stop running the rear and the center main bearing and all the big ends short of oil. Now, if we look at the Ford as installed in the Peton pole, things are a little different. The propeller is attached to the flywheel end of the engine facing forward and in level flight the Ford oil system can probably cope. With the tail on the ground the angle is about 14 to 15 degrees. At this point what is now the front main bearing with the thrust bearing and the centre main bearing will both be starved of oil and the dipper pans will cheerfully empty themselves into the back of the sump. Bernard Petenpole got around this problem by inserting a loose fitting pipe into the oil outlet. He then coiled the pipe around and with a T-piece fed the centre main bearing and what is now the front bearing with the thrust bearing. The drawing is annotated as a pressure feed, but more correctly, it's a positive feed. It's just making sure there's oil to run by gravity into the main bearings at all times. The dipper pan is modified too, with extra dams welded into each dipper bath to ensure enough oil even when the tail is down. There's an apron welded to the front of the dipper pan as well, which catches oil from the thrust bearing and diverts it straight into the pan. The two oil feed pipes, which are on the front of the dipper pan on the left-hand side, take oil from the pressure pump and from the valve chamber overflow respectively, thus ensuring a good oil flow down through the dipper pan when the tail is down. I'm gonna stop here and I've got a couple of reasons why. I'll show you one of them straight away. I've ordered some more fixings that haven't arrived yet. This bolt had a rather a damaged thread. I don't know whether the top of the nut had been damaged before, but when I managed to get the nut off. This thread was quite horrible. I've run a die down it carefully and it's better. And I ran a tap through the nut. It's half inch unified fine, but the nut's loose and I don't want to use it. It was a bolt from what is now the rear main bearing cap. So I'm awaiting some new fixings. The other reason I'm stopping here is because my wife and I are going on holiday tomorrow. I go off gallivanting around the world every month she keeps everything at home running and copes with all manner of vicissitudes and fancies a holiday. And quite frankly, she deserves one. Being a woman of excellent taste, well, of course she is, she married me. She's chosen a rather fantastic destination. I'm pleased about it too, because it involves an enigmatic British officer, Rolls Royce silver ghosts and upsetting the Turks. What's not to like? As always, thanks for watching.